Why are they going to laugh? They're going to laugh. Of course. I second it. <laughs> Contrary to public opinion. <laughs> mm. Good evening, everybody. I would like to call this regular meeting of our town council to order. Today is Monday, May the 8th, and it's 6 30 p.m. Roll call, please. Councillor Deneau? Here. Councillor Cooper? Here. Councillor Toner? Here. Councillor Burnett? Councillor Grinstead? County Councillor Lynch? And Mayor McGee? Here. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we work and gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people, the Salalga Nation has lived on this land for thousands of years, long before the arrival of European settlers, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to discuss this in this territory. And we have the adoption of the agenda. So the agenda for the regular meeting of council dated Monday, May 8th, 2023, be adopted. We're going to second her, please. Councilor Cooper, Councilor Deneau, all in favor. Uh, any disclosures of the pecuniary interest tonight? No. Questions for previous? No. Um, and we have the adoption of minutes of previous meetings. That the minutes of the regular meeting of council listed under item 7A on the agenda be adopted. Second, with me, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Toner, in favor. Uh, awards, delegations, and presentations. Delegations, uh, item. That is the financial statements, 2022 financial statements. Jennifer? Great. Jennifer, do you want to introduce our. Uh... Um, thank you, Mayor McGee. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Laura Huber. She is the lead audit, audit engagement partner from KPMG. Um, she's here tonight. She's going to be presenting the 2022 audit findings report. Um, and also uh, the draft 2022 consolidated audit financial statement for council's consideration. Just so council knows there is also a bylaw uh, on this evening um, that is there to, to adopt those things. And I'll turn things over to Lori now. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Good evening, council. Really pleased to be here this evening to share with you the highlights of the results of our audit for the fiscal year ended December 31, 2022. There are two attachments, I believe, in your package for tonight's presentation. What we have on the screen now before you is our audit findings. We've purposely included some of the financial statement components as part of our audit findings. So we'll work through this document, but certainly welcome any questions on either of the two attachments that were part of your package. So with that, we will jump right into it. If we scroll down a couple of pages to go to the audit highlights, The audit highlights summarize the findings of our audit and certainly where we are today with respect to the audit in terms of status. So we are essentially complete subject to having the discussion and the conversations here tonight with respect to the approval of the financial statements. Assuming they are approved, today would be the audit report date and we would be able to release our audit report in final. Our audit report is included in draft form that will be part of our presentation this evening. So with that, I think we might be having some trouble on the online version. Oh, there we go. We'll carry on. Um, page number six gets us into uh, some of the numbers for the financial statements themselves. So if we keep scrolling down a couple of slides, this is a snapshot of the balance sheet, otherwise known as the statement of financial position, which highlights both the assets and the liabilities of the corporation at the end of the year. I would say at the outset, overall, in terms of the accounting and the and the results for the year, very positive, along with the results of our audit. If you have had the opportunity to read through our report in detail, it really was a quiet year with no significant findings to report and a lot of good news along the way. So hopefully that will be the theme for the balance of the presentation. So we have given you some highlights on the right hand side in terms of the assets and the liabilities of why there are variances either up or down. I won't go through a lot of them other than to say you can certainly see at the top of the house there is a significant increase in cash. There is a separate statement of cash flows included in the financial statement package to give you all of the ins and outs of cash throughout the year. But really, the short version is related to the surplus that the corporation experienced year over year that we'll touch on in a minute. 
Some of the other items to bring to your attention that you might be of interest in terms of the liabilities, you will see that the accounts payable and accrued liabilities have increased year over year. A bit of a theme through some of the variances, there was a lot of, a lot of expenditures spent on capital this year and a lot of those bills were sitting in accounts payable at the end of the year which is often a function of timing on December 31. So that's a lot of that increase year over year. Another one that does get us a little excited as auditors and certainly as accountants is trying to best estimate the accrued landfill closure and post-closure. The public sector accounting standards do require this to be included on your balance sheet. Again, this year you'll see there has been a significant decrease year over year. A couple of things are incorporated into that change. Management do use their own expert by way of an engineer to come up with revised estimates in terms of the status of the landfill. In terms of capacity, that impacts the ultimate balance sheet item that you see here before you. And then, of course, another part of the calculation is the discount rate. The discount rate is very much fed and driven off market conditions and a change in discount rate. Uh, when the discount rate goes up, as we saw this year, the liability then comes down. So that is an estimate on your balance sheet and will fluctuate year over year, depending on usage and depending on what the market conditions and the, um, and the assumptions should be in that particular year. You will see also deferred revenue obligatory reserve funds have increased year over year. The real change for that increase year over year is related to the requirement to segregate any building fund surpluses on the balance sheet as part of an obligatory reserve fund. So that has been included there that you will see. And also the final piece there in terms of long-term liabilities, regular repayments did happen on the debt, of course, through the course of the year. And that's the reason for the decrease going from the 12 million in the previous year to 10.8 in the current year. So below the net financial asset pieces, that's where you'll see your investment in tangible capital assets, which has increased. The net book value has increased just over two and a half million year on year. That's a combination of a couple of things you'll see on the right hand side. We have given you a summary of some of the larger additions in year. Total additions were six million this year. And then, of course, offset by the annual charge of amortization, which was about 3.7 million. So all of those things tied together leaves the corporation with accumulated municipal equity or accumulated surplus at the end of the year of just over 108 million. So the next slide, again, I won't spend a whole lot of time, but often when we put uh, when we put numbers into pictures, it's a lot easier to see. Often we get questions around what is included in tangible capital assets on the balance sheet amount. This just gives you a breakdown of the different types of assets within that financial caption uh, for your interest. The next slide, we've given you a summary over the last five years of what the reserve and reserve funds have been. You can see certainly on a steady incline uh, for the corporation ending the year just shy of 14 million compared to five years ago, just shy of 8 million. So I often get the question when I do these presentation is what is a good number? And I, I can always say it really depends. So as you continue to put monies away for reserve and reserve funds, it's really meant to be married up in terms of what things you might have on the horizon, both from a strategic perspective or otherwise, and it really should marry up against your long-term uh, financial plan. The next slide is another slide again, just to give you a little bit of a highlight in terms of your reserve and reserve funds as a percentage of operating expenses. This is one of the metrics that the ministry actually uses as they look across the municipal sector. We've shown at the bottom, you're quite high. You can see just shy of 70%. And the benchmark from the ministry perspective is 20%. So you can see significant spread there and certainly on a healthy trend continuing upwards. The next one is also a question we tend to get a lot when you look at the balance sheet, what is the percentage of tax arrears? So that would be taxes receivable. So that would be tax revenues still not in the bank, outstanding as a receivable as a percentage of current levy. You can see as well, pretty healthy amount for 2022, um, a little bit of an increase compared to 2021, but certainly nothing to cause any concern hovering between the five and 6% range. And again, the ministry benchmark for this KPI looks at anything less than 10% as being good. So again, nothing significant to highlight from an audit perspective for your attention. Moving along, this gives you a summary of the statement of operations for fiscal 2022, which highlights the overall revenues and expenses through the course of the year. You can see at the top, the revenues from property taxation have increased and have increased even greater than budget. 
which may seem a little bit unusual, but certainly the corporation did experience an increase in supplementary billings uh, this year, which is why you see the increase year on year and in accordance with budget. Some of the other captions you will see as well, certainly fiscal 2022 felt and looked a lot different related to COVID compared to 2021. So that's why we're seeing increased revenues in year related to items such as user charges. Government grants are also up or what we call government transfers, which is the third line down. That's really a combination. The way public sector accounting standards work is if you get grant monies related to capital, those come through your income statement. So that's really the story behind the increase year on year, landing the year at just shy of 4.4 million. And then the other piece just to bring to your attention as well, which I don't think will be new or significantly different, but I would say fiscal 2021 was somewhat off the charts from a licensing and permit perspective with significant growth in municipality that has certainly leveled out in 2022 and is a little bit less than budget. When we look at expenses, expenses are shown a couple of different ways. Here they're shown by department. And if you look in note 14 to the financial statements, that's where you will see the expense categories broken down by object. Nothing significant certainly jumps out in terms of significant variances year over year. And if we flip to the next slide, we have given you a picture of the breakdown of the expenses by type. Um, overall, often I get a question, there tends to be a lot of focus on salaries, wages and benefits. So the corporation for 2022 was at about 34%. And I would say generally, we see that range to be anywhere between 26 to 35%. So you're certainly within that range towards the higher end of the range. Moving along in terms of the numbers and what we did to audit. So we carried out our audit at an overall planning materiality of $500,000. How we come up with that amount is we are allowed to use a percentage based on a benchmark being the revenues or expenses in the given year. We tend to hover around the 2% mark, which gets us to the $500,000. So that's overall financial reporting materiality. And to the extent we identify any differences greater than 25,000, which is simply 5% of the overall materiality, that was our threshold to have conversations with the team in terms of what was recorded in the books or not. So please to report here tonight. There's nothing that we identified through the course of our audit work that was not corrected in the financial statement. So all of the things that were identified have been incorporated. So there's certainly nothing off book that will carry into future years, which I think as council is also a good news story. Next slide in terms of control deficiencies, there's a lot of information here, but just as a reminder, a financial statement audit does require us to look at the controls and the systems and the processes that kind of culminate into the financial reporting process. So we've done that again this year, and to the extent we might identify any significant deficiencies, there is a requirement to report those to you. Please to report here tonight. There's certainly nothing from a significant deficiency in internal controls that is required to be communicated to you as such. So another good news story on this slide as well. The next slide, I won't go into a lot of detail other than to say a KPMG audit approach continues to be a risk-based audit approach. What that means is we stand back look at the financial statements as a whole, try to identify where we believe there's a greater risk of material misstatement occurring and certainly fleshing out an audit plan and audit programs to mitigate those risks. This risk that you see here before you relates to management override of controls. It's a presumed risk in any financial statement audit, so it's not unique to your corporation at all. You can see on the bottom of the page, we've completed the work that was required to mitigate that risk and certainly no significant findings to bring to your attention either. In terms of the notes that you will see in the financial statements, the corporation, just like all the other municipal governments, reports under public sector accounting standards. It was a status quo year this year. What I mean by that, there were no new accounting standards that were required to be implemented uh, this year in fiscal 2022. So you will see the significant accounting policies outlined in the notes to the financial statements at the very start in note one, and certainly nothing significantly new and different that caused us any concern nor anything to incorporate as part of the 2022 audit. If we go to the next slide, I cannot say the same for fiscal 2023. So if we look ahead, a lot of conversation is happening now in municipal government related to a new accounting standard coming into play related to asset retirement. So we have had preliminary conversations with management to make sure that the corporation will be well placed when this does come in a year's time. And certainly we will continue that conversation to make sure we're both uh, ready for the implementation. New standards come along often, but I will say it's not often that new standards come along that actually impact the financial statements. This is one of those. So we will stay tight and close to management to make sure that we are well positioned when we need to. 
So moving into the back of our report, we will jump right to the draft auditor's report. So all of our audit effort culminates into our one deliverable, really, with respect to the financial statements, which is on the next slide, which is our draft audit report. So it is a draft opinion at this stage, subject to approval of the financial statements, but it is a clean audit opinion. Based on what you've heard, there's no significant findings. We are content with what we saw through the course of the audit. So it is a clean audit opinion, again, for fiscal 2022 which is good news. And then the basis of the opinion along with the pages that follow, it is a three page audit report, but this is what a standard audit report does look like in Canada. It does cover off management's responsibilities with respect to the financial statements along with your own being those charged with governance as well as ours and our journal audit. So with that, I think that's a good place to stop. There's a lot of information in the appendices of our report, but I recognize there's not a lot of time maybe per se, and I'd welcome any questions and pause there if that works for the group. Thanks, Lori. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I, I did see in the appendices that our debt servicing costs are high in comparison to other uh, municipalities, also in the high category. Is there any indication for alarm as far as our debt management or anything like that? So, yes and no. So I would say, so the municipality does have does have a fair bit of debt on the balance sheet. You are still within your debt capacity, but perhaps in terms of plans for future, from my perspective, no, but maybe perhaps there might be additional information that management might want to provide in that context. To that, um, I think whenever you're looking sometimes with like a partner municipalities, as a small municipality that has water wastewater, you will often see um, slightly higher debt levels because you are going to have plant expansions and a lot of the um, infrastructure that comes with having um, uh, water and wastewater systems. So when you do look at those comparators, uh, you have to look at, uh, make sure you're comparing to other small urban municipalities that have um, significant water systems that aren't part of those comparisons. So those are see those higher debt rates. And I got, like when I looked at that too, I was kind of thinking it, it, it could just be like timing on when the projects were completed too. I mean, um, some, some municipalities may have may have done some some large expanse uh, some large expansions, you know, a, a while ago, and it might be off the books. But in the near future, they they may have they may, they may need like a an expansion faster than us. So then I would mm -hmm. believe. That's how I talk. I mean, I, I just think it's, you know, we have a, we we have our downtown. Uh, some of these places haven't had a downtown kind of uh, revitalization done. So whenever they do that, you know, you, have, you might see some of their their debt obligations. That's how I I didn't see like an alarm. I just thought it's it's just on the timing of where big capital projects are, but. So I think that is a very fair comment. And I did forget, this is the first year where we've actually included the municipal comparator information. So what we do is we pull FIR data, which is the financial information return data from the previous year, because of course, everyone's still completing the 2022. So that is a snapshot in time for December 31, 2021. So to your point exactly, it is a matter of timing and it could be significantly different very near into the next fiscal year. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care. Bye bye. Uh, second presentation. We have got the summer program events over you and excited to see Good evening. Happy to be here tonight. Give you a uh, bit of an overview of what's going to be coming in the next few months in the, uh, the event world. So, some background on the summer events in Arm Park. The town of Arm Park has historically ran numerous events in Arm Park, primarily at Robert Hudson Park. 
The events often embrace our natural beauty of our empire while also celebrating local talent and showcasing collaboration and teamwork with local businesses and organizations. Summer 2022 marked the successful return of most of our summer events following postponements or virtual events during the COVID pandemic in 2020 and 2021. Uh, on your screen here are some key dates. Many events you'll probably recognize from years past and a couple new events as well. Uh, we're getting right into it very shortly uh, with June and going all the way to August. Uh, first off is Recreation and Parks Month. We are celebrating that again this year with Recreation Task Force. So with funding from Participation and through partnering with the Iron Power Optimist Club, Recreation Passport returns in 2023. This campaign celebrates recreational recreation and parks month by eliminating barriers to participation and increasing healthy, active living. This year, Rec Passport will feature 33 activities in the 30 days of June. This campaign has ranging activities to allow those of all ages and abilities to participate. June is also Seniors Month, and we'll be celebrating through Recreation and Parks Month programming and events. Many of the activities on the uh, 30 and 30 are senior folks. Uh, full campaign details will be released on May 15th, with passports available to pick up at the Nixima Center or Town Hall the week of May 29th. Those who participate and return their passports to the Nixima Center are entered into a draw to win prizes from local businesses. Participants are also encouraged to log their active minutes on participation app and efforts to count our prior at Canada's most active community. A full list of activities and campaign info will be available on armcar.ca slash direct passport and inside the passport. Next up, we have Prior Palooza. On June 3rd at Robert Simpson Park, this event returns. It'll feature live music, inflatable activities courtesy of the Optimus Club, face painting, backyard games, and food and drink vendors, as well as the annual model train show will also be taking place at the Nixmo Center on June 3rd and 4th. Full event details were released last week, actually, but I had a schedule on that one. Um, on the event webpage, our prior slash prior palooza. And there are some more familiar names and some new names on our performer list again this year. Uh, concerts in the park. What to expect this year? The Sunday staple returns. We have a great lineup there as well, spanning from June 11th to August 13th. Again, some notable names you may remember and some new names on the, the schedule. All performers are scheduled from 2 to 4 p.m. on the Lions Pavilion at Robert Simpson Park. And a full lineup with more information is available now on artfire.ca slash concerts. Paddle Fest. This is a new event that we are doing in partnership with Ottawa Valley Air Paddle. Scheduled for June 17th at McLean Beach, Paddlefest offers free access to stand up paddle boards and kayaks, as well as free guided paddles on the Ottawa River. Paddlefest will also feature educational resources on water safety, as well as live music and family games. Paddlefest is scheduled to run from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., with parking available at the Ball Diamonds and the Washroom Amenities open at McLean Park. Full, and full event info will be available soon on the webpage archive.ca slash paddlefest. Canada Day. This year's event has seen great contributions through grant funding from the Government of Canada and a $6,000 grant and sponsorship from local businesses. Many of these activities and aspects of Canada Day and Arm Power have historically involved collaboration with local businesses and organizations, and we're happy to continue this this year. Uh, so what is happening on July 1? It starts off with the Lion's Breakfast at the Nick Smith Center, and the Community Activities at the Arm Power District Museum, Optimist Bobby Lego Bike Parade, live music and family entertainment at Robert Simpson Park, fireworks at dusk from the island below the weir, as well as other local events also featured in the town's programming includes Rotary Duck Race and Galilee Strawberry Social. We're reaching out to as many organizations and businesses as we can to collect as much info as possible so we can share all the fun that's going to happen on the day. Uh, programming at the park. A uh, bit of a schedule here, the land acknowledgement speeches and cakes start off the day around 11. We'll have live music from performers including Alan Wright and Friends, the Debenham Brothers, Main Street School of Music, and the Self Concert Band. There'll be family entertainment including face painting and playable games, and all this information will be available on our power job day slash Canada Day by May 15th. The Dragon Boat Festival. Uh, the return of the festival this year, for the first time since 2019, the, town of, the Dragon Boat Festival returns to the town of Arnfire. 
The three-year hiatus was due to COVID-19 pandemic, and we're thrilled to have retained the services of Alchemy to facilitate the races for us once again. Um, as of now, 16 teams are registered, and there's a nice diversity in communities being represented with four teams from Empire, eight from Ottawa, two from Quebec, one from Kingston, and one from Point. So we're happy to have many returning and new uh, folks into the festival this year. Uh, the festival would take place on July 15th, spanning the Madawaska River from the Marina Piers to the mouth of the Ottawa River. Races will take place between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. with teams setting up home base at Robert Simpson Park. Uh, the festival will also see the return of the popular Dragon's Dance around noon. Uh, full information is available online at armpower.ca slash dragonboat, and teams can still register if they wish to get in on the action. Theater of Fools. Uh, so what is this new event? Performing at Robert Simpson Park on Thursday, August 3rd, Theater of Fools is a pay-what-you-can show of Hamlet. This group from Ottawa is traveling over 40 parks this summer to reanimate Hamlet. We are thrilled to be one of the few locations outside of Ottawa selected. Their mandate is to present innovative, entertaining, accessible shows on the works of William Shakespeare. Uh, we're working with them now to have the promotion up. They are just about set to release their summer lineup, and that'll be on the town's events calendar shortly. So some important event notes on everything you just saw. Any events at Robert Simpson Park where parking will be restricted will have a golf cart, golf cart shuttle to assist in transportation. All events have their own web page where residents and visitors can find detailed information on the programming and logistics. Uh, new to that this year, we're working with the vendors there as well to give a better idea of who's going to be there and the cost on their services. So families and residents, visitors can have a better idea of how to plan to attend our events, as well as an FAQ on stuff like park rules, um, important stuff on like uh, open burns, that kind of thing. Uh, select events will have radio and newspaper advertisements. Well, all events will appear on the spring release of the Iron Fire Life and monthly newsletter. Uh, quick notes on some programming. Uh, summer camps are large this year. Camp Wanago returns at eight weeks at you know, the Nick Smith Center. And after testing out a ring at camp last year, we now have separate weeks for hockey and ring at camp at the Nick Smith Center in August. And we've teamed up with new local organization, the Auto Valley Theater Kids, to offer two weeks of theater camp where kids will work towards a Friday night performance at the end of each week. And just a quick note on some programming, you'll see some returning programs from previous years, include the adult senior and youth dragon boating, as well as beach volleyball, which became so popular we created a second night for it. Uh, we'll have pickleball indoor and outdoor, as well as some new programs with t ball, ball hockey, a soccer league sledge hockey disc golf, and our drop-in programs continue with crafting youth nights, badminton, and table tennis. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Lucas, just wondering for the any of the things that are happening down at Robert Simpson Park where we're running the golf, are we parking down at the hospital or where's parking the place for that? Uh, yeah, I believe those conversations are in the works now. Okay. Yeah, the hospital has agreed to allow us to use their back parking for free on the weekends again this year. So amazing. We'll be watching, watching for signage there. Great. Oh, that's a great partnership. Mm -hmm. Similar to what you saw last year, we were able to keep it so the shuttle was never working against traffic. Yeah. So the barricade was uh, strategically placed right by the hospital with someone manning it so that the shuttle was always on uh, on roadway but was not near vehicles, which made it much safer. Okay. And Madam Mayor, before I end, I just want to recognize both Oliver and Lucas for their tremendous efforts in bringing a lot of our events uh, to social media. You both did an incredible job in making nice advertisements that have really been easy to share, easy to digest. I know you've both been crucial for that. Kudos to you. Um, social media is awesome. And like I say, it's very easy to see what's happening. So you guys are doing a great job. Thank you for your help in that. Thank you. Council members, I would like you to know the date of July 15th, which is the Dragon Boat Date. Um, I want to be spoken to some of you about this. We've spoken to the Association 134 Empire. Uh, both will contain both staff and council members. That's something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, on the theater, we'll have seen them a couple of times. They're great. I'm not telling you that. Them, but uh, so I think we'll be able to tell you that people will not be able to see it. And, and I'm sorry to put you on this. I have one question about that Washington, uh, Washington date that a couple of people have been looking for dates on the Washington and the Washington State. I should have asked you ahead of time. 
Yeah, that's fine. Um, don't have a date uh, set just yet, but it'll probably be they typically open up four car a little bit, not usually the week before. Um, and then closes and typically after Thanksgiving. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no public meetings tonight. Uh, then table third. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting into the heavy stuff. <laughs> okay. We're at so a lot of staff reports. Uh, first one item A is the operating surplus. Mm -hmm. The council accept report 23 05 08. Dash zero one is information, and that council adopt a bylaw to allocate the 2022 operating budget surplus shortfalls. We're in the owner. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're going to do that. So for a bit of background, um, annually in the budget control cut, we can include estimated contributions to reserve and reserve funds. Um, and every year after the completion of the financial audit, when the presentation of the audit is called a financial things by the final auditor, uh, we do bring a bylaw forth uh, to council to finalize those contributions to the reserve and reserve funds based on the prior year operating surplus of the shortfall amount um, for reserve and reserve funds. So that's why we're here tonight. So the council does have a reserve and reserve fund policy that does include already specific direction regarding allocations of surpluses um, or deficits from various um, operating cost centers. Um, and in that um, reserve reserve fund policy, it already does provide authorization um, to the treasurer to utilize reserve and reserve funds to cover any shortfalls. So you'll see in the bylaw, those are the um, uh, ones that I have outlined in Schedule A that are already set those allocations for those reserves. And then the second part of the bylaw is the recommended allocations uh, for the town general operating surplus is also included in the bylaw. So I'll go over some of those with um, council for recommendations on where that the general operating surplus um, can be allocated. Uh, oh, sorry, a little bit more um, okay. background first. So I just want to let council know that while the operating budgets are estimates, um, the town does try to meet an internal target. Uh, we do aim for a 95% threshold of accuracy for um, the net estimated contribution reserve and reserve funds every year. Um, for 2022, the variance is slightly outside of the 5% window. We are sitting at a 93.66% variance uh, in this year. There are a couple of factors that I'll go over for what has caused um, um, a slightly larger budget variance than what I'd say would be the norm. Um, one of those first factors is, is the growth that was experienced in 2021. So um, whenever all that growth came through in 2021, um, MPAC was actually very quick a quick turnaround to bring a lot of those new properties onto the tax roll. So we did experience a lot of supplemental revenues coming through in the 2022 timeframe. Um, so our tax increment revenues uh, grew quite quickly. Uh, we were about 536,000 uh, greater than we had budgeted at that time um, due to all those new properties coming so quickly onto the roll. Um, another factor that in 2022 um, was interest, as we all know last year, we did have some higher interest rates, so we did actually end up generating um, an additional 83000 in um, interest earned revenue than what we had originally predicted uh, back in the fall of 2021 when we set up the budget. Also, another uh, major factor, uh, COVID-19. Um, the majority of the 2022 budget, we really did draft that in the fall of 2021, and you know, it seems like so long ago, but at that time, the COVID-19 impacts were, were still definitely a concern. Um, that we're still, uh, uh, you know what I mean, uh, and those high levels of uncertainties we had at that point still on how future years would play out and really how like the recovery phase and the impacts of COVID uh, would happen. Would people come, you know, back out, let's say pick up recreation and things like that right away, would it be a delay? We, we really didn't know. So I have to admit, we did set a pretty conservative um, recreation budget uh, for 2022, not knowing how quickly that would turn to normal activity levels would occur. Um, what we did see in 2022 in actuals is we did have higher recreation revenues and lower expenses um, um, overall. So what we did have was we had net cost being about 400,000 uh, less than what we had projected. I think after a couple of years of lockdown and everybody being inside, everyone wanted to come back out and do activities uh, quite quickly. So we, we did see that, that plus there. Um, and the last one, the last uh, major impact I would say on the 2022 numbers was vacancies. We did have a number of departments uh, impacted by some staffing vacancies for portions of the 2020 fiscal year, uh, kind of across the board, some of the planning, recreation, clerks, waste management, museum. 
uh, well, it did create some workload impacts on existing staff. The end result was we did have uh, lower expenses of what 275 paid than what we had budgeted throughout the year. So if you add all those up, that actually is the majority of the amount that makes up um, the majority of the variance for the general operating surplus was those factors. Um, so this table here, so that gives a, a nice good snapshot of, you can see from the first column, um, what did we budget uh, for contributions to the reserve and reserve funds? Uh, what were our actuals uh, for the budget uh, coming out at the end of the year? And then the third column, you can see that variance. So you had some reserves um, where we have shortfalls. So those are the ones that are in brackets. I'll take, for example, um, still COVID impacts. You can see our water and our wastewater uh, were both down. We had small deficits. Um, and I say deficits, it just in this case, it meant that we contributed less to reserves than what we had planned. So for example, we had planned um, to put, I'll say for wastewater, we had planned to put $463,000 into the reserve. We ended up putting $431,000 into the reserve. So we still put Four hundred thirty-one thousand reserves. It was just it was thirty-two thousand dollars less than we had that we had planned for. Not for it. So, um, at the end of the day, um, you can see um, the very last, second last line: the general operating surplus shortfall. Um, this is the amount here that I'll be talking about on the next slide, where there's some recommendations for council on where to um, allocate um, the general operating surplus. So allocations, so the first recommendation would be to bring reserve and reserve funds up to the recommended balances. So this would be, we have three reserve funds right now that aren't um, uh, to hit those uh, recommended minimum balances. So we have working capital, the cemetery reserve, and the marketing and economic development reserve. The second recommendation was um, at budget time, uh, we gave council some information on bill 23. So to give a bit more background on that, uh, with the changes of the development charges, the new development charge file that council passed, um, Bill 23 removes administrative studies from that, so you can no longer fund that. So um, over the years, the development charge reserve fund had an administrative study amount um, uh, in there, so we actually have to fund that piece of it. So this is um, helps fund um, that part of it because it can no longer be a part of the BPU. Um, the third recommendation. Uh, in order for an allocation would be to address some additional 2023 capital requirements. Um, you tonight on the agenda, there is a report from the fire department regarding the equipment repairs, and there's also a report on the voters at tender. So I won't go into those too much detail. You'll hear a bit more about them later. But we also did include on here also an amount for the mix with Senator Brian Dick repairs. Uh, council remembers this was back, I believe, in January, and we needed to have some emergency repairs done at the mix with center. Due to a Brian leak. So, this is going, uh, we're recommending some funding to um, fund that, uh, that overage. And the fourth recommendation would be to support future operating capital requirements. Um, this uh, is a recommended contribution to the Indian Reserve and also a recommended contribution to the Capital Expenditure Reserve Fund. So, Council could choose to allocate um, the 2022 operating budget surplus and shortfalls to uh, reserve reserve funds that are different than those outlined in the report or at a different quantity value. Um, this isn't recommended as the allocations do follow the requirements of the reserve reserve fund policy. They address the legislative financial impacts, such as the ones in Bill 23, and they also help support current year and future year capital requirements. So next steps, um, the recommendation is uh, Bernie Red, uh, so set the report of information, and then for tonight, um, there is a bylaw included on tonight's agenda to um, allocate the 2022 operating budget for, for council's consideration. That all is there any questions? I think I'll have to Always good news when you can give us more than one. Infection is good news, though. Remembering back to our budget deliberations, I believe in February when we passed budget in February, we had a couple of uh, discretionary reserves to open up the minimum balance. And is now our have we met that minimum balance now with the, the new allocation? So, yes. So there was three reserves that were not at their um, minimum balance. Um, this brings those three reserves that have those set in the balance with that for that. Um, that said, when you do re read the reserve and reserve fund policy, there's a lot of other reserves that say, you know, the funding the reserve should be in line with the future capital requirements. It's kind of similar to what Lori from KPMG spoke to tonight about how the reserves, 
it's hard to say what number your reserve should be at. It should really be, you know, matched up with what are your future kind of capital requirements that you're going to be meeting with reserves for. So, we're, um, so yes, we have now met if the bylaw passes all of the one from those set minimum balances, you know, as a as a whole. Um, you know, there's still some uh, room there, you know, to plan for future capital requirements as well. Um, one thing that isn't on here that has come up since budget was uh, for planning. And as we know, our planner is going to be going off on leave soon. There are a number of projects that are sitting kind of in the queue right now. And I've heard that there's been some delays with those. I'm just concerned. Is there any opportunity to put to some of that surplus towards uh, planning services in the future, kind of to bridge that gap between our, our planner going off and the heaven forbid you have to go off early? Um, just to kind of clear a backlog so whoever comes in is a little uh, less burdened with anything in the works. Okay, I can take that one. Um, so we have uh, advertised for the position of a, a planner to uh, for replacement and we're hoping um, to, to find somebody sooner rather than later so that we can not only have some overlap with the current planner but also help with some of the catch up of some of the projects that are outstanding. So so we, we're already in that process. If we're not successful in finding someone, uh, because it's a tight market for a term position like this, we will look at uh, the possibility of using a consultant firm that okay. um, may have uh, some resources that we could tap into. Don't know what those values might be at this point. So I would suggest that um, should we go that route and uh, find our budget a little short in the in the wage line under planner for this year, that we would be back to council to look at using some of the levy stabilization fund, not the SERP, because that one's for capital level, levy stabilization is for operating expenses, but we would be asking ask for council for uh, for some of that savings to, uh, to put towards that position. Okay, so some of that money would still be liquid that we could access for that purpose? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah. yeah, so one of the intents of the levy stabilization reserve is to help council for any kind of unplanned fluctuations or something of an operating budget that we have in order to help fund something like that. So that would be a good example of a use um, of why you have a some of those funds put aside. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So on that note, is that something as well as we could um, we could prioritize? Um, I mean, we're off of them getting well, mm -hmm. the volume is just to keep our one person. Yeah, you are a terrific person, but you are one person. And then, you know, I've heard from a few people lately that there there are some challenges with getting things moving is because of the volume. Too. So, much. so is there a way to expedite having maybe that consultant? Because if we look at our history and find secure government mm -hmm. planners, uh, we were so lucky to get Alex, but we you know, it didn't happen immediately. And uh, so I know is there a way that we can do that sooner than later so that we can get things because we're all moving out you know, every day that there's one building on the ground and we have to buy Yeah, fair fair question. And as I said, we've put the call out for them, and I think we have some uh, interviews scheduled over the next week or two. I think if you give us a chance to see how those go, if uh, if we have any concerns uh, after that, um, we'll certainly uh, not hesitate to reach out to the consultants and start getting some costs and timing from them. Okay, for sure. Great. Great report, great news. Um, so the recommendation is that way. Does everybody uh, uh, yeah. all in favor then? Harry, Thank you. Uh, item 12B, the award tender. The council award the contract for tender PW 2023-07, Cranston, Smokum, Maple, and Gardner Rehabilitation to RW Tomlinson Limited for a cost of $1,755,029.24, including HST, and that council directs staff to fund the budgetary shortfall of $567,458.19 to award tender PW 2023-07 from the 2022 operating budget surplus. And that upon the CAO's approval of the final form of the foregoing documents, council authorized the mayor and clerk to enter into a contract agreement with RW Tomlinson Limited to execute the works. And welcome, Brian Gunn. Good evening. Um, yeah, we're uh, probably expecting the uh, report up here. So <laughs> look at it down here. Um, so yeah, we're here to talk about uh, the first two of our capital projects that we've entered for this uh, construction season. The first being the 
207 Cranston Smolt and Maple Gardener um, project. Um, so some background on that project. Uh, as part of the 2023 capital budget as approved by Council on February 13th, uh, 2023, there was an included capital project for the 2023 Rolling Road Rehabilitation uh, with a budget of $1,063,000. Um, moving forward from budget time, staff proceeded by generating a tender um, for the, for the scope of work, which includes the replacement of sidewalk, curb, uh, road surf, and road service on Cranston Street between Smolkin and Maple Drive. Uh, Smolkin Street from Cranston to Maple Drive, uh, as well as all of Maple Drive and all of Gardner Street. Uh, also included within the scope of that work are some uh, uh, strategic line painting and uh, street markings to help try to curb some, uh, some speeding complaints since uh, we introduced some traffic calming on Cranston Street as the, the main through street in that neighborhood. Uh, left out of the original scope of work in the tender was uh, the first block of Cranston Street between Ellen Drive and Smolkin Street because it was resurfaced in 2021. We have, however, included uh, full sidewalk connectivity on both sides of Cranston Street to provide uh, better pedestrian connectivity from pathways that already exist on Cranston Street, as well as sidewalks on Allen Drive, all the way to AJ Charbonneau's pathway that, that comes from Cranston Street into the back of the school yard, as well as into uh, sorry, Campanelli's uh, subdivision. So on March 31st, the tender was published for bidders. Questions were to be submitted by April 25th, 2023. Tender closing date was April 28th, 2023. Uh, upon the closing of the tender, there were four, uh, four bids received uh, from one of RW Tomlinson Limited, which is our low bid of $1,552,882.26. The other three submissions were from Econ Construction East Limited, Common Capital Construction Limited, and Paper Paving Limited. Um, on how evaluation of the tenders, uh, RW Tomlinson submission did include uh, a couple of errors, uh, which actually reduced their bid price from $1,555,987.40 down to $1,558,882.26. So a reduction of three thousand one hundred five dollars and fourteen cents. Greenwood Paving's also uh, Greenwood Paving Limited submission also uh, had a math error which reduced their bid price by six dollars and nine cents. So R W Tomlinson remained the lowest price um, when or, or even with the adjustment. Um, following the closure of the tender. Uh, staff negotiated a scope of work with R.W. Tomlinson based on unit rates that were included in the, the uh, tender uh, to include an additional uh, 1,127 square meters of paving and 220 square meters of sidewalk, as well as 281 meters of curb. Um, this would extend the project limits on Smolkin Street from the intersection of Maple Drive all the way up to Allen Drive. Previously, we had left that section of the road out of the tender because there was some, uh, or due to adjacent uh, development, which will be tying a slump sewer connection into Smolkin Street. However, since the time of closing the tender, we've learned that the developer is targeting an earlier construction date than we originally anticipated, which would allow for them to do their work in Smolkin and for our contract to follow behind their work and resurface the road in one continuous patch. Uh, staff have also included an allowance for contract administration and inspection of $50,000 in, uh, in the budget. So if we look at financial considerations, uh, the capital budget for 2023 includes $1,063,000. Um, the price including net HST for RW Tomlinson's uh, original scope of work when adjusted for net HST is $1,398,418. The additional scope of work adds an additional $182,039.62. So the total construction value of $1,580,419. Plus staff included a $50,000 allowance for part-time contract admin and inspection. So that brings a total 
estimated to, well, total budget, including the $50,000 allowance of $1,630,458.19 when adjusted for net agency. So we have a funding shortfall of $567,458.19, which staff are recommending uh, that this cost is funded from the 2022 operating budget uh, surplus. Okay. Sums it up. So the two options that we included for council would be that council could choose not to award the project. Uh, however, staff are not recommending this option as it does the project does fit well into the town's asset management strategy in improving municipal infrastructure. The second option would be that council could choose not to move forward with the expanded scope of work, uh, which is the second <laughs> section of Small Pit Street between Maple and Allen Drive. Um, and we could award the smaller originally tendered scope of work. Um, we again do not recommend this option as coordinating uh, as coordinating the work in on this section in the basic path it would be beneficial to the overall project which is fine. That's everything I've got. Um if you got any questions for me. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just want to say I appreciate the efficiency and the the added scope of work there. I think it's well worth it. Uh, it costs more in the long run and just disruption if we if we didn't go ahead. So it's good having that in there. I agree. This is exciting. We hear a lot about that being throughout all of town, but some of the aviation is actually kind of the sidewalks and Yeah, just if if by chance the new development doesn't get to their work as they anticipate. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that the, the additional scope of work, the price that has to be done next year would, would or it would be uh, higher or would the scope of work just be canceled and it will going to get tender next year? So likely what we would do is <clears throat> we would still undertake the majority of the work on that block. Um, worst case scenario, if the contract developer didn't move forward at the proper time, and we would leave out a section of goblet and asphalt wide enough for them to do their excavation, let them come in, dig the road, do the storm sewer connection, and then make them reinstate like full, full curb to curb, nice and neat. Uh, so it's a full patch and it's not like a intermediate, like a localized patch in the middle of the road. So that would be worst case scenario, and it would still be a reasonably decent product. Um, but again, we're based on our last conversations with that developer. They've got a contractor pretty much lined up for this summer. Um, still some approvals to work through, but uh, we're based on what we heard of the conference there and we have that work through too. So. Okay, great. And my other question, uh, I apologize for, for not remembering, but um I I do believe that the the curse, the one sidewalk right now on Cranston does not get plowed in the winter. That's correct. So now that we have two, uh, it would be nice if we if we had one of them um, like plowed. Um, I mean, it states right here that we're that we're we're putting the extra sidewalk in to you know to help pedestrians you know move from pathways uh, you know and get to the school and. Uh, I know I was a big advocate for having having it done last time we talked about the snow crying, but it would really be nice if we could maybe bring that back up and just um, just for a safer route, just because I mean we do get lots of requests and um, I know Fast and Drive is uh, you know some kids you know some kids walk along Fast and Drive and when they ask me and the schools ask me I say well if if you're concerned about getting to AJ Charbonneau from let's say Fairbrook Court, something like that, you there are like alternatives. You can you can cross the street and turn right on Allen Drive and you know make your make your way uh to to AJ Charbonneau. I mean there there are alternate routes if you're really concerned about safety. And then possibly when the new development happens, I believe there's going to be a way to like Zigzag into the school, and um, because I know sidewalks on Baskin Drive right now are not a possibility because it's not a, uh, a boulevard. Is that what it's, it's, 
the, or, the challenges are yeah, competitive yeah, dual cross I categorize both in ditches. Yeah. So it, you know, we need a full upgrade of urban storm sewers with catch basins to handle that drainage. And and obviously there's there's the coordination uh, with the county because the county yeah. is responsible for the drainage. So that is something that we have in our long range plan to urbanize fast and drive, which would ultimately see the installation sidewalk. So that is in in plan, but it's two years out still. Uh, but to your point, yes, that new proposed development on Baskin Drive will have a uh, sidewalk to it as well. With a, the idea that it's going to connect uh, through the school expense, I think that's just subject to school putting their final approval on that. Yeah. Uh, and then the same route that they will be connecting the storm sewer from the development route to Smolkin, uh, a little hard to explain, but uh, Alex will be back soon enough, I'm sure, with that, and we'll explain it to you. Um, there will be a sidewalk path through there as well, so that will connect the smoke and through there development. So it will be a nice link. Um, but just to go back to your original comment about uh, storm clearing on Cranston Street, that is certainly something that we are looking at. It's something that uh, we've discussed internally a little bit, um, primarily due to the fact that the road was recently opened up um, into the housing subdivision. So um, as we noted, we have heard some concerns with uh, speeding. A lot of that, I think, is increased traffic volumes, um, not always speeding based on some of the data that we've gathered with the radar speed time. But certainly, volumes have increased. It was basically a dead end subdivision, and now it's it's pretty much turned into a minor collector road. Um, probably not quite to the same level of traffic that E Street would get uh, heading into that subdivision, but it's it's the second close uh, close behind. So traffic volumes are increasing, so that will be enough. Uh, that combined with the fact that there is a uh, pathway through school is uh, is reason for us to look at that picture. So, um, certainly not part of the report tonight. No, no, something we'll look at and uh, probably get yeah. from us um, before our next one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, Absolutely. Report. Um, so, all in favor on that one? Thank you. And well, you're up again. So uh, next one item C awarding ten the council award the 2023 Daniel Street intersection realignment and culvert replacement tender PW 2023-08 to Goldie Moore Limited for a total of two million one hundred and fifty thousand and fifty nine dollars and thirty six cents, including HST, and that council award inspection and contract administration services. For tender PW 2023-08 to JP2G Consultancy for a total of $98,479.50. And, and that the CAO be granted <coughs> authorization to enter into a funding agreement with the County of Renfrew for $684,356.96, excluding HST, and that the remaining budgetary shortfall of $452.13 be funded by 2023 capital surplus funds if available or 2023 operating funds and that council authorize the CAO to execute the agreements and related documents with the County of Renfrew, Goldie Moore Limited and JPTG Consultants Inc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, from you. Uh, so this one's for PW 2023, oh. the Daniel Eady Gallon Street intersection. Uh, realignment as well as culvert replacement on E Street. Uh, again, going back to the 2023 capital budget um, passed on February 13th. Um, there was a project included for the realignment of Daniel Street, E Street signalized intersection, included uh, in that also with the E Street culvert with a budget of uh, $2,100,000. Uh, staff received by generating a tender, which included the scope of work, which will realign Daniel Street, E Street, and Galvin Street to create a four way intersection, um, as well as uh, replacing the existing 1800 millimeter CSP culvert, which is underneath E Street, uh, with an 1800 millimeter concrete culvert to address both failed infrastructure as well as extending the need to extend the uh, E Street culvert. Uh, this improved alignment will, will benefit both pedestrian, improved alignment, pedestrian crossings, and Traffic signals will improve vehicular and pedestrian safety at this intersection. Uh, so here's an example uh, visually of, of our proposed realignment shown with Galvin Street towards the bottom of the page. You can see the uh, Daniel Street, the E Street culvert at the top of the page, and then the Daniel Street running east there, left and right on your page. Um, you can see where the road shifts. Uh, 
Galvin's, Galvin Street shifts somewhat to uh, realign the EDE is coming back the opposite direction to more better or more closely aligned with Galvin, uh, turning what was a three way intersection into the four way intersection. Uh, here's another view, another aerial view uh, from the other opposite direction. Um, again, it's laying it over the current configuration of the intersection. You know, uh, dramatically, the, the intersection is shifting. So on March 20th, 2023, staff published tender PW 202308 via Merck.com with tender closing date of April 14th, 2023. Uh, upon closing the tender, there were two, uh, sorry, submissions were received from two firms. Uh, they were evaluated by staff and uh, following the evaluation of the results are as follows. Will be more limited was located with at $2,150,000. $59.36, including HST, followed by Thomas Cavanaugh construction at $2,832,471.08. Uh, upon evaluating the tenders, there were no discrepancies, math errors, or otherwise found with either of the submissions. So, Willie Moore was it remains the lowest price, uh, submitted price at $2,150,059.36. Uh, staff also received a proposal through standing offer agreement from James to G consultants for sites, full time site inspection, as well as contract administration services uh, for a price of $98,479.50, which includes full HST. Um, there are some utility relocations that are required to facilitate this work also. Uh, the municipal portion of Hydro One's work is $98,360.22. Bell Canada's uh, fee proposal, the municipal portion of that is $40,813.34. So, when adding everything up financially uh, and adjusting for net HST, Goldie Moore's uh, bid will cost $1,936,195.05. JP2G, $88,630. $83.84, Hydro One at $88,819.57, followed by Bell Canada at $36,753.68 for a total of $2,150,452.14. Um, again, the, uh, the capital budget includes $2.1 million for this project. Uh, which includes a county uh, county of renters financial contribution, which is included in their 2023 budget at a, uh, a value of $684,356.96, excluding HST towards the project. Uh, town also, the town also holds a $50,000 deposit from the fairground subdivision developer for future upgrades to the Daniel and Calvin Street intersection. Um, so when we add that together and account for net HST uh, with the total cost of Goldie Moore's tender submission, JP2D's proposal, Hydro One utility relocation quote, and Bell Canada's utility quote, we total or the total cost is two million one hundred fifty thousand four hundred fifty two dollars and fourteen cents, which means a shortfall of four hundred fifty two dollars and thirteen cents. Uh, staff was, uh, recommending that this shortfall be paid out of available 2023 surplus budget or 2023 operating budget funds as necessary. So, yeah, um, our recommendations are that the $452.13 shortfall be funded by available surplus, as well as the council authorized the CAO to execute agreements with. And, and related documents with County Renter, Goldmore, David 2G Consultants. Any questions? Another exciting one. You? Folks will be able to find that. Use them. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving along to sale and declarations to council. The council waived the requirement of the public notice policy ASCP 08 to provide 30 days notice of a permanent closure of a highway and direct staff to provide 10 days notice of their intention to close a portion of the road allowance known as ED Street and declare those lands 
as surplus lands to the town of Armpire, and that council in its sole discretion deems the lands to be non-viable and exercise their authority under section 6.5.2.5 land exchange of policy ASCP 14, sale and disposition of land, to negotiate a land exchange solely with the abutting property owner, and that council authorizes staff to negotiate a land exchange with the abutting landowner pending the successful completion of the stopping up and closing of the portion of the E.D. Street Road Allowance, as outlined in this report, and that council directs staff to provide notice of council's intention of the sale and, dispos and disposal of lands in accordance with section 6.6 .6 of policy ASCP 14, sale and disposition of land. And I'll try and explain what <laughs> So uh, as part of the project that uh, uh, Ryan and John have outlined, um, there is uh, the need to replace uh, an existing culvert under E Street and to actually extend it um, to properly uh, locate it under the realigned uh, E Street. So in um, reviewing the, the engineering for this project, it was determined that uh, really the town will require some access to private lands to uh, replace that culvert and, um, and get on the land to do that work. So what we determined was the property at the corner of Daniel and Edie, the uh, west, northwest quadrant, I guess, the bigger parcel there, um, is owned by uh, the same person who owns uh, the, the home uh, on Edie Street to the north on this map. So you can see my, my pointer, but the home at the north side is also the owner of this large rectangular shaped piece uh, fronting on Daniel and Edie. The other thing we determined was that E.D. Street and Daniel Street, quite frankly, are quite wide in the road allowance uh, in this intersection. We're not sure why, but it would appear that the town acquired a parcel of land on E.D. Street, which allowed E.D. Street to connect to Daniel back in 1956 or so from a lovely lady. And the reality of the what they purchased with the town acquired at that time was quite a bit wider than a standard road allowance. It's about 133 feet wide instead of your standard 66 foot road allowance. Same, same deal on Daniel, and again, I'm not sure how, what the um, history of it is, but you can see we own quite a bit of uh, road allowance on Daniel, uh, much wider than a, a typical road allowance. Um, at any rate, when we started determining uh, how we could replace this culvert that um, basically follows the creek uh, under Edie Street, it was determined that we could really use some additional land there to be able to do that. So the lands shown on the, on the sketch in blue are basically what the town is looking to acquire from the landowner. And after discussions with the landowner, it was determined that they were sort of interested in some additional frontage on Edie Street to sort of even out the front of their lot. You can see it's quite quite a bit of depth beside their home that they don't own uh, that is part of the road allowance. So while suggesting we close up a part of Edie Street sounds a little daunting, it does not mean that we are closing Edie Street to the traffic that, that uses it, we're just basically bringing the uh, road along it in line with the, uh, the rest of Edie Street to the north. And, um, and not impacting the, uh, the use of ED at all. Um, so basically what the report does is um, outlines some recommendations of how we, how we get to that point of a land swap that would see the town get the land that it needs for the culvert and the neighbor, uh, a budding property owner, uh, be able to uh, make better use of their property. A couple of things have to happen. First of all, we have to close that section of ED Street from being a road, stop it up and close it. We have to adopt a bylaw and, um, and register that. By law. In order to close a road, we have to give notice to the public. Our notice policy says we'll give 30 days notice. However, we also have to declare that land surplus. And when we do that, it basically means we own this piece of land as the town, but we don't really have any need for it. It's surplus to our needs. And in order to do that, you have to give 10 days notice. So we're suggesting in, in an effort to, to speed up the process here and not expecting too many concerns about the closure of ED, if we could just give the 10 days notice for both processes, that would be great. Once council has given notice of that, we'll be back to you with bylaws to close up and stop E.D. Street uh, and declare those lands surplus with council's intention to divest those lands. <clears throat> Until you do that and make a deal with somebody, you can always change your mind about divesting surplus lands. But when you do do a, a, a sale of land uh, under our um, sale and disposition of land policy, you can do um, a couple of things. You can de declare the land as non-viable, which means we could sell it on the open market, but it's really not going to be of use to anybody. It's not buildable to anyone but the neighboring landowner in this case. So it would be considered non-viable. And you can you can enter into negotiations with the landowner for a land exchange, which is what we're proposing. 
you in this case. So the uh, recommendation tonight to uh, to do all that, basically, um, I'll put it back up there, but I won't read it again, but that, basically that's the steps to get to the point where we can um, we can bring something forward to council to uh, to perspect this uh, negotiation and the exchange of land uh, to, to assist us in getting this culvert replaced. I think that's, that's the gist of it. If you have any questions, happy to find yeah, as one here. A win, right? <clears throat> or the council authorizes required repairs of the basket leveling system to the fire department's aerial ladder truck by commercial truck equipment corporation and that council authorize the expenditure of an estimated maximum amount of $33,982.26, including HST for the repairs from the 2022 operating surplus. Yes, tonight I'm here to uh, present on a portion I expect and certainly disappointing issue that has occurred with the town uh, fire department's area ladder truck. Um, the Pure spill fire apparatus that ran into service in January 2019 suffered a mechanical failure of the leveling system for the basket portion of the platform area. Uh, on Friday, on first during a routine exercise of the apparatus. Uh, after our own efforts to resolve the issue, uh, Bob Bose has indicated the need for a service technician to run into diagnosis issue. That diagnosis indicated that two electric rotor actuators. That performed the leveling of the basket and failed and required replacement. Uh, since that day of the diagnosis, the aerial has remained in service with limited abilities as a pumper and a water tower only. So, using the ladder to make access to an elevated uh, location would be difficult with the current state of the basket. So, this is what our 2019 Pierce basket on the platform should look like. And this is what it currently looks like uh, due to the mechanical failure. A little closer looking at the uh, moving parts here. And this is the rotary actuator, one is one on each side that can put together to love, keep the basket level so that the ladder brings us it keeps it level for safe operating uh, person inside. Um, and as well. Um, in speaking with Pierce, um, as I might have already indicated, this picture shows the part identified as the weldment, which will also require to be changed. In talking to Pierce, uh, this change requires the rotary actuators to be on the truck. They're uh, no longer available or on the state. Place what requires a change of design connecting points. Uh, basically, all parts engineered and designed for the, uh, the apparatus. Um, their function uh, just can't simply uh, make a modification to the uh, to the basket to accommodate the new rotary actuator. So that part of how the person is at all. Um, as I indicated in my report, the cost of the repairs has been estimated at maximum of $32,992. Uh, that includes HST. Uh, the supply dealer that we purchased there, the vice run, has been working with Pierce to get the town some relief on costing. For this repair, there are three. I did travel to uh, Toronto um, last Friday to uh, two individuals there, and there are, to be told, there are three different sources possibly available from Pierce to the town for the uh, warranty of one of those possibilities. However, this is likely not a source as our one year warranty on this part is no longer available. They have another uh, source called Service Campaign, similar to a product recall. This fund is usually used when the issue is found to be occurring in many uh, applications and the funds are applied from that source. And then they have a goodwill fund. This is the most likely source available to us. And this to be used uh, basically to keep customers satisfied with the product that they purchased from the manufacturer. Um, I have uh, stressed that um, 
where we are happy with the services that we have required and the apparatus as well. And we would like to continue to be happy with the jurisdiction of the choice of providing our property. So, um, consideration um, that council authorized expenditure of an estimated maximum 33,900, including the HST from the 2022 operating surplus. I used to see that if your number was lower, so that was net. Yeah, I think it was <laughs> Jennifer's better about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just discussed it with the big evening. Um, and Jennifer's price was a little bit lower because of the HST. Um, they said I did travel to Toronto and uh, as has been the case uh, since the very first moment in conversation. Um, Pierce uh, personally is working with Pierce to try and get some uh, some money. Um, the argument being that they understand that the the actuators are no longer on the warranty. Um, however, the, the changes that in, in the other parts because they're no longer available isn't really their problem. And there are certain warranties still um, on the vehicle with regards to uh, welding and um, structure. So we're hoping that the one part that he's coming off of the uh, basically, the way it works, I think we have to move and find out when this will take place. And the, the process through Pierce is, is lengthy. Um, you, you can carry on with the repair, commercial does the repair, and then you set a report on the repair to Pierce. And the adjustments are made based on the report from the, the technician and does the repair. So, um, parts are on order, um, some are in transit. The actuators themselves are sold on back order. So we will, if they're also looking at other sources other than the supplier, possibly another dealer, or maybe from the manufacturing floor itself. I told the neighbor that's back to get those services quickly as possible. That's that's kind of where we're at right now. Um yeah. Um yeah. any questions? You're hearing Is back in service. No one wants a back in service more than me. We did have an incident um, recently that uh, did involve multi residential. Um, fortunately, we were able to operate and put it out of it. Um, but the time we made it was off. We wanted to back in service. Um, well, that's and again, um, it's a it's a different operating um, sorry, different design. Most of the most of the trucks are hydraulic, so they just hydraulic. Where this is without electric and so forth, or the new technology, or we should say, and technology is new as long as it works. Um, so maybe we're back in drawing board with this, and um, but the, the actuators themselves are not made by Pierce; they're made by here is that situation. Uh, fingers crossed, and uh, hopefully, we as much uh, help as we can. Yeah, the recommendation is for the maximum of $30,000. We all favor on that one. Yes, 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 yes. None of those things. Thank you. I don't have a draft sign of speculation. The council received staff report 23-05-08-06 for information as it pertains to subdivision file number 47T-22002 relating to Norma, Ida, and Charlotte Street extensions at 242745 Ontario Inc. draft plan of subdivision and that council pursuant to previous section 5120 of the Planning Act hold a public meeting May 23rd, 2023 to allow for public review and comment. Good evening. All right, so this is for a residential technician proposal. You see here at Eastland, which was the location of the subject property in blue in relation to David Eagle's number. So here is an aerial image of the subject in the property. So this property is a vacant lot on the Vigil Street, about an existing dead end of Charlotte Street North, Norman Street North, Ida Street North, and Hawthorne Street North and Dan Street. 
um, the property is approximately 3.2 hectares or 7.9 acres. So, in terms of some context, the property is northeast of the sorry, the property northeast of the second property is the Haley's Grove and the Grove American Home. Um, the Haley's Grove is shown here outlined in yellow. Um, the southern property is not part of Haley's Grove, uh, it is part of the home. And to the southwest, our existing detached dwelling is on Van Street. Um, southeast, our existing detached dwelling is in the northwest, northwest of Costa Vision Street, is an existing agricultural property. So, shown here is a contest plan of the proposed lot layout, including the approximate location of Champlain's lot. Um, the proposed strip of subdivision includes 11 blocks of council units, totaling 50. Five temporal storm units with a stormwater management block at the southwest side of the property. So, in terms of the provincial policy statement, the scope and subdivision is consistent with the TPS 2020. Um, the proposed development contributes to a range of housing available in the on site community. Additionally, we would continue to pressure the housing design to meet the findings of the environmental impact study in order to avoid and mitigate impacts to the natural heritage features. The developer is responsible for ensuring they obtain the necessary federal and provincial approvals for all termination and rehabilitation of the water course as a part of the So the other property is currently designated well as medium density residential, the entire higher official plan. The town has a water permitted use in the low and medium density residential designation. The official plan policy um, being 2.4.1a. Is the predominant form of housing in development areas shall be in the form of detached dwellings, and then this provides less than 50 percent of the new dwelling units in the contiguous development area. As more than 20 units can comprise a single detached dwelling. Um, however, as determined by staff that the principle of development city plans was established by the zoning plan that was completed in 2012 prior to the current special plan, it was only when the property, which is residential floor section 39. In the course meeting, does not permit single detached dwelling. So, the closed dwelling is in keeping with the other policy objectives of the official plan, which aims to choose more compact forms of residential development um, and a mix of housing types. Uh, so, the proposed development doesn't have a mix of housing types, but it is in an area that doesn't have a lot of existing townhouse dwellings that create that mix overall um, in that area. So the multiple connections to the existing road pattern will also integrate the development within the adjacent surrounding road network. And the nine meter wide storm water management scale to be constructed as a natural red hair and wetland feature it will help create a buffer between existing attached dwellings and the more complex water dwelling with proposed dwellings. So they've proposed passing with parkland, um, and the passing with parkland. It was an official plan saying that you can consider practicing parkland in this case, particularly because if they um, buy the parkland and put it on the required rate, rate, they would lose more than 10% of the proposed fee, um, which is a significant reduction in the number of units that they would be able to make up for. So, in terms of the official plan, it's also constantly um, stated. Um, of our paradigm plan is designated um, wooded area and natural area for a portion of the site. So the official plan identifies that dwelling and site restoration should not be created in fish habitat, except in accordance with the provision of federal rural requirements. The dwelling and site restoration shall not be committed on adjacent land to a natural area feature in areas identified in section B.12 of the plan, unless the ecological function of the adjacent land has been evaluated, which has been demonstrated that there would be no negative impact on the natural features of the ecological function. So, as part of the incentive application, they provided an updated environmental impact study that was completed and identified a natural and physical settings of the subject property with a focus on confirming the presence of absence of natural and physical features and potential species at risk for the habitat. So the environmental health study identified that tax significant woodlands in the Bay is low um, and, and habitat associated with wildlife habitat and habitat species at risk in the low. 
a class of 15 users who have to learn from the open space zone. That's consistent with the zone bylaw 2012. Um, and that would result in a 10 meter buffer from the building still property that's actually made by said school um, and a five meter step back from that 10 meter buffer. And so the other piece of the environmental impact study says that where habitat loss can't be avoided in terms of soil water course, the nine meter easement for stand current stormwater services be installed and defined as a natural right turn wetland feature to convey stormwater through the site. Um, additionally, to provide protection of potential seed beds from the habitat on site, um, reptile and avian stream protection should be installed around all the construction areas prior to installing the site operations. And um, should any seed beds be discovered throughout the course of the development of the site, operations should stop and seed beds are filed with the local and district agency contract. So these are ways of covering seed beds that work on the site during the site visits to the environmental impact study if it comes far down from the So again, applicant is responsible for obtaining the prior approval and federal approvals for the proposed logic for calculation. So generally we will be consulting with the Department of Fisheries and Open as well as the Bureau to determine what approvals are going to be required. So the current zoning is residential forest section 39 to 42 to 14. That permits townhouse dwellings subject to provisions in the residential forest zone. An additional provision is part of section 39. So section 39 is from that 2012 zone bylaw amendment. And it requires a buffer strip um, a width of 10 meters or five meters beyond the vegetation of the pond trees along the property line, whichever is greater. To make the find the, the buffer strip, and that should be required along any portion of the lot line by the open space zone. So, in the result, those are zones and not open space, so that would apply to any land along the road. Um, and then you would require setbacks on the buffer strip as minimum five meters. The proposed development conforms to that current zoning, and uh, the zoning. Subject to building 14, which prevents development fire or removal of the building, which includes consistent with the required study and signature of the subject. So, in terms of the next step, um, there's a public meeting that's been proposed um, and held on May 16th, 2023. Following the public meeting, a staff report will be brought to council and will include comments, issues, and options, including recommending conditions for that plan of subject for approval. Um, it will also following that, um, the, the gap plan conditions recommendation will include summary of all the comments received at the public meeting, as so well as the decided and presenter. So, do note that Chamber 2 is only at the middle of the public meeting is no longer required to be voting at for a public presentation. However, in consultation with the parties, we have decided that any specific maps that we have been received prior to that change to the planning act, we're still going to hold a public meeting because census has essentially been informed that a public meeting will occur. Um, so, in order to meet that commitment that we've made to presence, we're going to have an annual public meeting, even though we're not required under the planning act. Um, there is also no um, and a third party appeal. So that means that residents of neighboring property owners under the Chamber 2 of the Planning Act don't have the ability to appeal the decision of the county on um, a federal exam decision or the city of the Chamber of the Planning Act and the Chamber of the Planning Act and the Chamber of the Planning Act. Um, so that's something that we're noting tonight and something that definitely needs to know this is a public meeting. This is not a change to the town of Armstrong policy, the town of Nancy policy. This is a change at the provincial level. Um, and it's been something that um, occurred a few years ago. So, just kind of informing a couple of that change, because it's a change that's uh, But 
the public meeting will still be speaking public and speaking on the direction, um, especially in terms of shaping the development. Potentially, how much state and public continue needs to shape the division development, strengthen that acquisition so that the strong development to our community. So, um, the recommendation is that council receive the report for information so that it comes to the subdivision file number 47 slash 22002 um, and the council pursuant to previous section 5120 of the all the public meeting may transfer to the committee to allow the public to Did we have questions or comments? If we want, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have I have a few, uh, Alex. Uh, the 10 meter setback from the Gillies Grove, and I guess the five meter buffer. Who is going to own that piece of land? Is that going to be the the, the new land, the new land owners? Will, will, will that be their back of their their lot, or I'm just not, I'm just kind of curious. So if the if the ten meter buffer and then the five meter setback, yeah, um, and that would be owned by the new private property owners. Okay. Um. So obviously, they would be responsible for ensuring that the remaining the buffer stone is fired by the new. Okay. Great. Um, we could also look at options for something that would be a just one title for that. Um, so and the source of the back. So. Okay, no, because I mean, I'm I'm always wanting. I'm not a fan of cash and lieu of parks. I mean, I I want every I want every development to have have a park, but I understand the limitations here. And I was excited when, you know, that 10 meter setback from the Gillies Grove, I don't know that it's established plus the five meter, I mean, the five meter uh, buffer. I just saw that there's like an opportunity then for, you know, uh, I'm just thinking if there's no car for the kids to play with, that at least there's, uh, there's, a, there's like a forest that, that they could um, venture into. And so hopefully, uh, it would now not all of them are going to be are going to own a piece of that buffer for us. Um, but it would be nice if there were if there was some way that uh, all the owners of that new subdivision that anybody that wants to like meander through um, that woodland would be able to. So that uh, that that's just my that's my vision. And I don't know how that goes about it. I guess it's important to note too that this property is really a bus, is like Gilly's Grove, yes. which will have lots of opportunity obviously for access, as we know. We're you know, just so blessed to have that in our town. So I, I understand the concern. I think the important part is for these residents, they will have quite a large backyard to be able to use their own amenity space as yep. uh, landowners. Um, they want to really, you know, contain, contain the natural feature of it. So these are going to be lots with. You know, significant with a, a standard rear yard setback for townhouses 16 meters. These ones will have 15 meters, so they'll yeah. have you know a larger than normal, a double the normal setback requirement for a backyard. So they'll have a, a beautiful green space to set behind them. And then on the opposite sides of the roads, I think you'll see that nine meter um, riparian feature in the backyards of those homes, or at least adjacent to them. So there will be a lot of green space there. So yeah. you know. Not not exactly a play fe play feature, but certainly uh, a lot of green space available for these residents to enjoy. So that's right, and then I, that I'm, like that's all I, I I have a wish for is you know I don't want it to be all you know back small backyards, but if there's it, it looks like this has lots of opportunity for you know parkland space or uh, may not be like a play structure, but you know what kids these days can use a bit of natural uh, natural fun. Um, the other thing I noticed was some of the roads going up that kind of uh, lead into Elgin Street. Um, some of the site triangles are uh, are not very safe. You can't you can't see 
I know the residents that live on those streets right now have to deal with it, but now with the increased um, number of houses, um, Charlotte Street in particular, it's hard to see left, I guess, so it's hard to see traffic coming you know, east to west on, on Elgin. Um, so I was just wondering what's going to happen. I mean, what's going to happen? What has to happen there? Just, I mean, we may have to like talk to some of the homeowners to make a better site triangle just for safe, safe access to Elgin Street. The other thing that like that connection was not trying to well also create a link between Charlotte Street North and the River Street. So we give people an alternative that in Texas may not have quite a triangle right now. Okay. Um, so it gives them essentially a safe or alternative by going through the division street using this new connection. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying that there isn't potentially something to look at in terms of that um like angle and the Um but it does mean that that can't be achieved, so I don't just be building a both people in such a way that you know it must be really the building you're yeah. asking again the visibility. Um there is a, a, a gonna be a new intersection. I'm 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 happy yeah I'm happy with it myself. Uh, it looks like they've all they've all the province or whoever does the environmental studies kind of before you know they've acknowledged the fact that the Gillies Grove is there and they're taking that into consideration and they're taking consideration into the wetlands to you know on the other side. So um, I think they're doing what they can do and. I'm okay with that. So I have a couple of questions. I, I know this is going to be a fairly contentious um, development, just given the proximity to the Grove. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. Who does site investigations for species at risk? Is that someone that the developer hires or is that the ministry or who would be the person that would do that? So um in the environmental impact study they look for species at risk and habitat for species at risk and they look at that for both potential and actual other uh sightings or habitat mostly on site okay um, at the same time the ministry does have mapping that flags areas where certain species at risk might be found okay. so, um, so the developer will kind of do that more detailed analysis of the site. Um, the province will identify ranges for certain species and certain types of habitat where they can be found. Um, the environmental impact study will be peer reviewed. Uh, so the peer reviewing is making sure that uh, the way they've done this step up analysis and the observations on site is robust and is consistent with that. Okay, and are these um, site investigations, are they ever made available to the public to review? Uh, so the environmental impact study is available to anybody who would like to look at it. Okay. So the best part of the package, which is okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, in regards to the cash and loop for the parkland development, I know there's a large stormwater management pond being put at the end. Is there any possibility of having that pond be open as a community pond rather than a functional pond? Uh, for example, have a pathway that goes around it where the public can still use that space um, without it being closed off to the public use. It's, it's quite a significant piece of land. And I know we have the grove there. I just, I really hesitate to just say, well, the residents can all just go use the grove because the grove doesn't belong to us. And the NCC's goal is conservation. So having that added foot traffic from all the residents that are there, just as a matter of course, because we, the developer wasn't required to put in parkland, just it doesn't sit well with me because that's a lot more people using it. So I'm wondering if if there's any, if we can even ask the developer if there's any consideration to having that as a community pond instead of a, just a functional storm pond. Uh, so I would have to defer to our operations team to mm -hmm. 
Oops, my light is out. There's a possible bit of time for sound. I'm not sure we've gotten to the heat of the body that so hard in the condo. That's a good time to work it up. Yeah. <laughs> so we can kind of discuss that with the developer. It's going to depend on the amount of storage that they need for storm matter. Okay. Um, and how they can accommodate that on the house for so that they can. Okay. So that would if I have seen the size of the function to do a little bit, okay. so we can bring it to their attention. So that when they're doing the okay. Okay. And with a 10 meter setback that goes in between the properties and the actual grove itself, um, you indicated the property owner really is responsible. They own that land there. There is native species that are going to be put in there. Who's responsible for maintaining? Is that the property under the maintaining for that same standard that is prescribed within document? So the zoning requires that the, the native species be planted um, as part of the development. Okay. Um, it would then be the property owner's responsibility not to basically remove those species. Mm -hmm. um, but there wouldn't be necessarily an expectation that each property owner in the village is removing the native species that happen to fall off. Mm -hmm. Um, it's always a good idea for property owners to control native species, mm -hmm. um, but it's not something that would be reinforced for some. Okay, okay. Um, sorry, a few more. So it's just to, to clarify too, so the NCC is right next door. Under the province's guidelines that the province has made, the NCC, for example, would not be able to file a third-party appeal, and we have no say on that whatsoever, or anyone else. So it's the province that's really creating that situation, not the town of our fire. Right. So okay. the, the list of who can appeal um, for the vision of the vision. Um, I don't remember if I fully listed the house in the report. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's limited to those individuals with the Planning Act, which is a public body, mm -hmm. specified person. The minister of the municipality and the contract commission for a public body and specified person. Okay. Um, so, specified person does not include members of the public. Mm -hmm. Don't remember the definition of public body uh, by the fire. Mm -hmm. so don't need to be the municipal entity. Okay. Okay. Okay, and just to know, I, mean, I really, I, I think it's for all of us, we, I welcome the public's input in this process. The province has made significant challenges with Bill 23 to build homes faster. And I was talking to someone, we held a yard sale on the weekend, someone came up and said, did you hear what the town is trying to do to the Grove? Um, and there, there's a, a perception that, you know, the town has started this process, the town is pushing to paved wetlands, the town is pushing the grove out. Um, it, it's a, it, it's not an accurate portrayal of the situation. Uh, I, we all love our wilderness. We all love this. This is a property owner that owns this property and is playing by the rules. Our role as a council, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm clear from Adam Mayor, our role as a council is really to make sure all the boxes are checked off. Um, Stopping progress like this uh, in its tracks because we don't like it is a very, very difficult thing to do. It's a very costly venture. And our obligation is to make sure all the rules are being followed. Um, I really do want to hear what the public says about this because even if we don't have the power right now as a municipal council to do it, it sends a very clear message to the province that does set these rules where the, the thresholds are. Uh, if we look around the GTA, the, the green belt is under tremendous pressure right now to be developed, crown jewel of our province, and municipalities are powerless to stop um, progress from in there. So our grove is the jewel of our empire. Uh, it does kind of get me to see it being uh, so closely developed, just in proximity to it. And I, I will be looking at the environmental impact study just to make sure Everything is uh, is good from my limited <laughs> satisfaction that I can I can do here, but I do I really want to see the public come out and talk about this. 
um, and to understand what our role as a council is, because we aren't against you on this. Uh, the town is not against you. Uh, we're on board with any frustrations that you may have when it comes to um, sensitive lands being developed sometimes. And that's all I have to say. Certainly Okay, so uh, all in favor? The council received report number 23-05-08-07 as information and the council direct staff to advise the township of McNabbury site due to the significant amount of administration that would be required to implement a billing agreement for McNabbury site. The town is not in a position to entertain such an agreement at this time. Oh, uh, sorry. We'll bring a second to see Catherine Janelle. Yeah. Uh, I'll take this one. So, um, I, I, we have received some correspondence from McNabber, so that I wanted to bring to Council's attention. Uh, and also, I just wanted to take an opportunity to sort of run through the timeline for you and then we can uh, get into a bit of a discussion. So, uh, just a reminder that most of this uh, council is a little aware of, but in, on December 22nd, uh, 2022, we did receive written notice from the Fabry side of the termination of uh, the joint use recreation agreement. That termination would be effective June 30th because there is a requirement in the joint use agreement to uh, notify us by December 31st of the previous year uh, and affect the change uh, of the termination on June 30th of the next year. Um, they did indicate that they were able to negotiate a new agreement. On March 28th, staff brought a report to council, which outlined the background of the current agreement, discussion on the pros and cons of that agreement, and the methodology that was used to uh, uh, create the agreement. It included considerations on termination and possible negotiation of a new uh, joint use recreation agreement. It was a closed session that night under Section 239.2BK of the Municipal Act. And during that uh, discussion, Council uh, appointed the Mayor, Councillor Grinstead, and as an alternative, uh, Councillor Cooper, uh, to the Joint Use Recreation Committee. Um, this purpose of that committee is under the current joint use agreement to um, look at the population adjustments for the current year uh, per section 7.6 of the agreement and the requirements to do that before May 31st. Uh, well, immediately following that, that meeting, Mayor McGee called Mayor McKenzie, I guess the next morning, which would have been March 29th, put that on here, uh, to advise that the town was not in a position to proceed with negotiating any joint agreement, uh, joint recreation agreement at this time. Uh, and followed up with a letter on March 30th, which indicated that, and also provided the names of the committee members for the current discussion. No response has been received yet with respect to a meeting date to do that. On April 24th, 2023, uh, Council adopted a revised Schedule K, which is the recreation fees in our user uh, fees and charges bylaw, and directed staff to implement policies and procedures for the cost and model uh, for hybrid user groups. Uh, the reason we did this on April 24th was um, it took so long a bit of time to put those numbers together for council and to come up with the policy and procedures um, that we can, can implement because that's new for us. Um, the reality is we start summer registration on May 1st, so we wanted to make sure that we had the numbers in place uh, for non-users uh, in time for registration. On April 28th, we did receive a letter uh, request from the library side asking council to disregard the letter received on December 22nd and to reinstate the original joint use recreation agreement. 
Further to that, on May 3rd, we received a request from the Niagara site for a meeting with staff and those committee members that we have identified, uh, the treasurer and myself and the recreation director to discuss the process for non-resident fees applied to the Niagara site residents, specifically tracking and invoicing. Uh, I have outlined in the report, uh, just to go back to that, I have outlined in the report uh, before you tonight some of the concerns council or staff have with respect to the potential for uh, an agreement that would um, be in essence similar to the recreation or the billing agreement we have with the town of Renfrew. As council will recall, we entered that in agreement um, as a billing agreement to assist Renfrew. That agreement deals strictly with co programming at the Nixon Center and only for residents of Renfrew itself that um, make use of our facilities since they don't have a pool. We find those numbers to be relatively low in the grand scheme of users of our facility there. It seems like 9% of, uh, of our users in total. Um, and it's a fairly um, uh, easy exercise for us to know the new, uh, new software to, um, to quickly pull out the rent for uh, attending that pool programming. The idea of doing the same thing for McNabb Rayside for all of the Nick use and Nick Smith Center uh, uses and um, facility uses that could be uh, applied to McNabb Rayside residents. Uh, it seems a bit daunting. It would depend on you know what type of program they're in, whether it's a one-time user fee of uh, a drop-in, a program, or uh, as we've shown, uh, the um, hybrid uh, user group model. So it's not an easy task. It would be onerous on us from an administrative perspective. And while we recognize that uh, providing refunds to the residents will be onerous on their staff as well, uh, we we're suggesting to council at this time that it, to implement a building agreement with McNabb side would be a significant administrative burden on our staff. Uh, since the cancellation of the agreement uh, in December, our staff have obviously spent quite a bit of time coming up with uh, a solution for us uh, in lieu of an agreement. And, um, I want to thank my staff for spending so much time on it. It was not time we anticipated spending this year on this, but the agreement that was to go uh, another five years. So it's been a bit of an impact on us already. Um, but at this point, uh, our recommendation to council is to uh, receive this report just as information and to uh, direct staff to advise the Madbury side, uh, as I outlined through the significant administration that would be required to implement a billing agreement uh, that the town is in a position to enter into such an agreement. With that, I'll open it up for any questions or discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for all your time on all of these files. Uh, big questions and comments for the recommendation. I'll, uh, I'll start. I'll start. Um, I'm certainly in support of the recommendation. Um, however, I do think that uh, negotiating a new agreement, I think, is in the best interest of both municipalities. Um, and I, I still think that that's the best course of action. But I do want to let everyone know that I am not anywhere near in support of the current like per capita figure that McDad is paying right now. So if a if a new negotiation, like a new agreement was to be uh, mm -hmm. talked about, um, I would I would only support a number that's fair and equitable for uh, both municipalities. So uh, I think it's uh, it's the most efficient way to get this kind of get this resolved. And uh, yeah, so I I I do think that we should put our efforts into um, negotiating or renegotiating a new contract with the caveat that um, it, in in my mind the the number that they pay per capita is going to have to increase significantly. So, but if they're willing to do that, um, I'm willing to support. Yeah, I uh, pretty much agree with everything that Councillor Toner has said. I, uh, you know, it's 
there's not a lot of easy options in this uh, situation, but in, in my view, the best thing for both municipalities is to have a deal, and I, I believe strongly that a deal is better than none. And, uh, you know, I, I also follow the, the, really the philosophy of what that deal was, was made on, is that, uh, you know, while we are two different municipalities, we are really one community. And uh, in my view, that a deal is, is just more efficient and better for both municipalities to operate in, uh, in recreation. My, uh, my stance. No, just want to say it's it's good to see um, with this request to reinstate that our neighbors are recognizing the value that our deal presented. Um, I reject any comments that state that our prior was less than transparent with our numbers, with our dealings. Um, we're good neighbors, and I'd like to see it remain that way. It's very frustrating um, from the town's perspective, from our council's perspective. I think we've taken a lot of information into account in making our decision. It wasn't an easy decision to say that we weren't going to negotiate, but in my opinion, we didn't have a lot left to negotiate. Um, to give an analogy, it was almost like we had a 1% mortgage that they were locked into and they called up and said, we're going to cancel it, but not only that, we want you to come back with a better rate. And then when they realized that they're now paying 6%, they said, hey, we'd really like that 1% back. Well, the financial reality is that that 1% that mortgage that they signed on for is now a 6%. So to Councillor Toner and Councillor Denote's point, the financial reality of any recreation deal that we go forward with would have to be significantly more in tune with today's financial reality. Our Nick Smith Center does need does need capital repairs, capital investments. Um, and if McNabb Brayside is on board with that, that's something that benefits both communities. Um, I don't know, it, it's disheartening sometimes listening to the, the comments that split hairs and really um, disparage the agreement as being a one-sided um, in favor of arm fire, because it, it wasn't uh, financially, it benefited our neighbors, and we were okay with that. We never once went back and said, we want more money for that, even though there's $1.34 that we're paying per capita, and it's $1.34? Uh, $1.40. Um, it's even more to, to your 34. We never once went and did that. Um, so I just wanted to be reiterated that we were not part and parcel of canceling the agreement. We were not approached before it was canceled. And I think a lot of these discussions that we're having right now that are very difficult could have been had prior to the cancellation of the agreement. And it's a lesson that I hope is, um, is learned through this process that, that speaking before making a decision that has drastic impacts on our neighbors when we make decisions, we really should carefully consider them. And I implore our neighbors, if we do re-enter negotiation, um, to think the same. The onus, in my opinion, is not for our staff to spend more time reformulating an agreement that we have already spent a lot of time recovering from and formulating. I believe the onus is really on our neighbors to come to us and say what they feel is a strong deal. That is the beginning of any negotiation. We have nowhere to negotiate from, from a cancellation. That's tearing up the agreement. If there is something else presented, um, speaking for myself, I am certainly open to considering all options that benefit Armpire, McNabb, Brayside, and our neighboring residents. Uh, so just to summarize, I, I really feel like there, there may be some common ground here. There is common ground. We're, we're two communities that's the same family. Um, but I really think that the onus is on McNabb, Brayside to come to us um, and to really work towards creating positive and comfortable communities at this time. Um, the request that's before us is to uh, renegotiate or sorry, reinstate the agreement. And having watched every single one of their meetings, followed every single one of the reports, I struggled to reinstate something knowing that we were going into it only to exercise option mm -hmm. five or something, which is yeah, the, 
Entering a new negotiation, knowing we'd be starting with the dispute is not a great foundation. Um, as Council Cooper noted, they now have five months to come to us with a proposal. We, the information's been out there. Um, it goes after for the information that we've allowed them to make that you know, good faith negotiation proposal. Uh, on the suggestion that negotiating is in the best interest, I struggle. I struggle to use the fact. We received a staff report just last council that showed that we will be made, we will be financially whole ish with a small shortfall um, based on the increased user fees. But the, the defining difference is that our residents, the ones that we are tasked with taking care of, our retailers and residents, will receive increased access to programs that we have all heard. They are frustrated with not having the option to use. Despite the fact that, I mean, my you, we've been paying $140 for their 37 38 I'm, I'm not okay with that. I can't, you know, it, it's not personal. It has nothing to do with, you know, we, we value our, our neighbors. There are so many interviews, many collaborations that we're going to continue to do. But we are responsible to our product and our taxpayer. And you know, going and sitting back at the table to negotiate something when we're starting with a dispute, knowing that they canceled, they thought that they were getting an unfair deal. So it, it just, the uh, staff have put in hours and hours and thought this through. They've given, um, you know, a, every possible iteration. And now, now that they, they've given us a package that we all accepted, we're being asked to hang on a second, come on back, and let's enter into this resolution part of it. I'm, I'm not okay with that. So um, the staff recommendation here tonight is to receive the report and, or sorry, um, let's see, it's to request to reinstate and to, can you read that again, please? The council received report number 23-05-08-07 as information and that directs council direct staff to advise the township of McNabb Brayside due to the significant amount of administration that would be required to implement a billing agreement for McNabb Brayside, the town is not in a position to entertain such an agreement at this time. I think we all said no to that. Yeah. yeah. We all said no to the billing agreement. I just made comments knowing probably that maybe seven foot no less, and maybe they will, as Councillor Cooper said, and maybe they'll come back and say, you know what, we will maybe want to have a new agreement, then here's the price we're willing to pay. I mean, at least that, I just think I, an agreement, I understand what, what you're saying, but then what, what, that, what that does, is that closes the door of ever having an agreement with McNabb Rayside from now until the future. If, that would that's what you're arguing. Mm -hmm. Um that's that's my argument. No, that, that's but, right, yeah. But agreeing to what we have on the table here doesn't change it any more than it didn't, uh, they are still welcome to come to us with, but they've never come to us with anything. No, nope. not once. Mm -hmm. Other than please cancel and then please leave. Mm -hmm. yeah, no. So um, nothing has changed in that regard. If they if they want to come to us with something, then yeah, well, we're not going to do the work for everybody. No, no, right? not, no, no. Nor am I comfortable having staff and having, um, you know, my time is precious. Well, only sitting down, only to enter into a dispute, and you know, and if you do that, we then have an agreement again. So we're just advancing on that agreement that we be entering. It's the same one we have now. We're paying one hundred and forty dollars mm -hmm. per capita. So we're thirty-five, thirty-six. We're not re-entering that it's going for. So, um, so my recommendation: let let um, what we try to let going on the, the staff recommendation for this one please all in favor may make one comment um just on the subject of the population uh there is the meeting that is to be held uh, between township and the town to go over the population numbers i just want to make sure we define that the scope of this is just it, it's typically been a formality um, to, to go through and look at the population numbers, um, just so there's no misconceptions on why we're sitting down at a table together. It's really just to go out and there's been some concerns raised about the population numbers. 
So I just want to make sure it's clear that we're sitting down to look at these population numbers, to explain them, to answer any questions, and that's it. We're not sitting down as a renegotiation. There's nothing more to that than just basically formalizing a process that they require um, as part of the agreement. Is that correct? That is correct. And that's being the past if it's been our treasurers and uh I think pressures in the mayor is looking to be able to sat down and basically use the population numbers and most of it's uh, quick and administrative. And these population numbers, I'm just noting that it was a letter that was sent on March 30th to the to Mayor Mark McKenzie that has been, he's already received this information. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so if you could please again, please. <laughs> sure. <laughs> this is what it is that we are deciding. And that council received report number 23-05-08-07 as information, and that council directs staff to advise the township of McNabb Brayside due to the significant amount of administration that would be required to implement a billing agreement for McNabb Brayside. The town is not in a position to entertain such an agreement at this time. All in favor. None of all of that carries. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, and then we have three proclamations. Uh, the first one is for Parks and Recreation. The Council proclaimed June 2023 as Parks and Recreation Month in the town of Red Park. And then you have Karen Lachman, Councillor Cooper, Councillor Juno, and then are you going to be the I, I can. Whereas in the town of Arpar, we are fortunate to have a variety of recreation and park systems providing countless recreational opportunities for residents and visitors from around the world. And whereas recreation enhances quality of life, balanced living and lifelong learning, helps people live happier and longer, develops skills and positive self-image in children and youth, develops creativity and builds healthy bodies and positive lifestyles. And whereas recreational participation builds family units and social capital, strengthens volunteer and community development, enhances social interaction, creates community pride and vitality, and promotes sensitivity and understanding to cultural diversity. And whereas parks, open space, and trails provide active and passive outdoor recreation opportunities, help maintain clean air and water, and promote stewardship of the natural environment. And whereas the benefits provided by our recreation programs, services, and parks, and open space reduce healthcare and social services costs, serve to boost the economy, economic renewal, and sustainability, enhance property values, attract new business, increase tourism, and curb employee absenteeism. And whereas the town of Rampar is hosting 33 activities, it might be 33, in 30 days as part of the Participation Community Better Challenge, the National Physical Activity Initiative, it encourages Canadians to get active in search of Canada's most active community. Therefore, the town of Rampar does hereby proclaim June 2023 as Parks and Recreation Month in the town of Rampar and encourages all citizens to recognize the benefits and values of recreation and parks in our part and participate in the many activities taking place this month and throughout the year. Favor, anyone? The council proclaimed June 2023 as Seniors Month in the town of our part. Whereas Seniors Month is an annual province-wide celebration to recognize the considerate, considerable contributions that seniors have made to the life and vibrancy of our community, and whereas seniors continue to serve as leaders, mentors, volunteers, and important and active members of this community, and whereas their contributions, past and present, warrant appreciation and recognition, and their stories deserve to be told, and whereas the health and well-being of seniors is in the interest of all, and further adds to the health and well-being of the community as a whole. And whereas seniors are the fastest growing population segment across Canada, and a significant number of Rampar seniors are leading healthy and active lives. And whereas the Town of Rampar's Recreation Department, the Greater Rampar Seniors Council, and Seniors Active Living Centre provide regular age-friendly programming for local seniors. Therefore, the Town of Rampar hereby proclaims June 2023 as Seniors Month in the Town of Rampar, and encourages all citizens to recognize and celebrate the accomplishment of our seniors. All in favor on that one. There we go. And our final problem. The council proclaimed June 2023 as Pride Month in the town of Arpa. Thank you, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Jones. Whereas June is recognized in Canada as Pride Month, a time to celebrate the contributions of persons from the 2S LGBTQ plus community 
and increase efforts to build awareness. And whereas the Progress Pride flag is an important symbol of hope and acceptance for 2S LGBTQ plus youth and adults who continue to face stigma, discrimination, isolation, and bullying in their home, workplaces, and community spaces simply for being who they are. And whereas this stigma and discrimination puts 2S LGBTQ plus individuals at elevated risk of mental health issues, substance abuse, homelessness, and suicide. And whereas the Town of Rampart acknowledges and celebrates the contributions of the 2S LGBTQ plus community to the social, cultural, and economic well-being of volunteerians, and whereas during Pride Month, we can all reflect on the progress made to recognize and protect the rights of 2S LGBTQ plus communities and the work that still needs to be done. And whereas flying the rainbow flag at Town Hall during the week of June 2023 symbolizes the town's celebration of diversity and support for the 2S LGBTQ plus community. Therefore, the Town of Rampar hereby proclaims June 2023 as Pride Month in the Town of Rampar and encourages all citizens to think about what steps we can collectively take to make our community a safe and inclusive place for all, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. All in favor of that one. Okay, now I'm told if I leave that we don't have four. So we have a short break. Certainly. <laughs> Might leave us off. Um, first thing up is uh, is the mayor's report and the technology is not always our friend. It didn't transfer, so I'm going to be reading it off my phone, but it's okay. I got it. So, uh, I attend the Arm Fire Alliance dinner uh, with members of the club and other invited guests, uh, including potential homeowners and uh, the senior community. Uh, there was a presentation similar to the one that had been provided by Tim Schools on the house controls on the housing needs assessment. They had community members who were also interested in affordable housing, uh, plenty of thoughtful discussion and life experience was shared around the table. Uh, it definitely is encouraging to see uh, all hands on deck in the effort to uh, move forward with this important file. Uh, I was invited also by the uh, Greater Arm Fire um, Community Council on Poverty and Homelessness to attend a uh, session, the Summit for Strength which is a collaboration with Tamarack. There was a full day session at the library and uh, uh, over 35 people around the table, roughly, um, you know, from, from the county, from um, guest speakers or panels. It was, it was terrific. Um, maybe the highlight, I mean, it, the discussion was great, but they provided lunch that was created using uh, food bank, uh, food from the food bank. And, uh, uh, Chickpea, I, I wouldn't even want to describe what it was, but it was like a mush chickpeas with spinach and rice. 
Anyways, it was it was just terrific. It's great to me to see everyone's back. And we'll keep in going around your physical services. I my expanded notes have all of these hand teams, so I do apologize if it's uh, it was an appreciated class. Uh, I recently joined Warden Heeman and uh, Emo and County Councilor Lynch for breakfast in town. Uh, we met for a few hours, discussed county needs, community plan initiatives, future goals for county affordable housing, uh, tourism. Uh, he's definitely alongside with uh, with many of the things that uh, council have discussed that we discussed at our community plan session and share some of the initiatives that the county has got as well. Uh, very exciting. I've had multiple ribbon cuttings to report for each of the last few meetings. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've uh, been we trying to save across the street, um, along with uh, MPP Carol Gallon and Mayor Mark McKenzie. This is a family owned and operated business, along with other pharmacies outside of my car. They have several of them. And they've got uh, intentions. Um, uh, th this I thought was curious. So they have intentions on providing a compounding option of that pharmacy. And it will be a value service, um, having driven all over uh, the world looking for compounding pharmacies or something like that. Description. They're very limited. There's not many pharmacies that actually provide this. And right now, the closest one for our empire is in Redford. Uh, so the fact that they've got the space and they've got the intentions of providing that service um, is, is uh, appreciated. And they also have deliveries. And I like the fact that they're really becoming community partners as well. They recently did. A breakfast at the station loft with residents there to present their offerings. They they go for the breakfast and they wanted to explain to them um, we do delivery, here's our plan, one on one too. So they, they're really trying to make a difference. My other river ribbon cutting uh, was at Colbert Brewery, uh, where there was a, a packed house to celebrate the occasion. Uh, definitely a warm and lively space filled with energies and collaborations of many other local businesses, which is something that our town seems to be becoming uh, known for. Uh, I missed the, the Saturday patio opener. I, I would love to have been there. Um, but uh, congratulations to uh, Farmer Plus and Colbert. Thank you for putting in, in your celebration. Uh, and I briefly attended the Packer Banquet at Murray Anza Center on the weekend. Uh, it was great to see the team gathered in a casual environment off the ice, together with the coaches, family members, and supporters. They had a great season and uh, can't wait to see what they have in store for us next year. Um, I found some information on economic development and the financial benefits of uh, having hockey teams. And you know, we've all seen people make an evening of it. They go for dinner, then they go to the game, game right? So it's, um, again, that's on my other, other notes, but it's, it's not insignificant. So uh, celebrating them and hoping that they move forward and do well next year is going to be. And uh, that's my graph. Okay. Um, we don't have did down um, the Kim Council Lynch have this report on? No. Okay. Um, we have any committee reports or minutes? Just a quick one. Um, over the weekend, and it is in the correspondence package as well, but I just wanted to highlight that the our public library held their Little Branch's Rural Roots conference over the weekend. Over 130 attendees came from all over the province. Many neighboring um, municipalities sent librarians for a variety of workshops, uh, networking, special events. It was fantastic. Um, just want to thank the other trustees that are on the library board who attended, volunteered, gave of themselves to make this a success. Uh, big thanks to Karen DeLuca and to the steering committee. They pulled it all together and it was amazing. Um, the new uh, part of the building is now open and attendees were able to sit there and enjoy the nice bright sunshine coming through this weekend. So quite nice. I was able to convene a workshop on 3D printing and micro bits programming that was extremely well attended. There's been some requests to hold something like that here and also held a, I presented a, a workshop inclusive storytelling. For children and adults with exceptionalities and kind of gave some ideas from an educated perspective of, of things that they could take back got some really good ideas from the other librarians that were there and so forth uh it was an excellent experience such nice people so it was great to have them visiting our town they had an opportunity saturday night they did not have anything booked for dinner so it was a bunch of wild librarians on the town um, and they enjoyed shopping at their local stores and asked them what did they buy and uh, they named all the different businesses. They had clothes they bought. Some of them went and bought uh, treasures that are different 
antique stores downtown. And um, the general sentiment was they were very impressed with the farm park. Some had never been here before and they will come back. So just the value of holding a conference like that, uh, fantastic, it, it was great. So it was uh, my honor to be part of the library board and represent it there. And our library represented themselves very, very well for our prior. So thank you for that. Oh, just an update. Yeah, just an update um, on the archives, just so that people know that uh, the archivist uh, Emma, uh, she has accepted a new job uh, with um, Library and Archives Canada. So the possible start date there is uh, June fifth. So uh, the board will be looking for a new uh, a new archivist. If anybody has an archivist in their back pocket, you could certainly uh, use one. And also with that, uh, with that departure, uh, the archives, they were successful in getting a summer student, uh, a summer student, a summer student intern um, who needs to be supervised by an archivist. So because our archivist is leaving, um, yeah, the board has let them know that we won't, we won't be able to um, be taking that to some student intern position. So if uh, they've, they've come through um, looking for an archivist in the past, and I'm sure that uh, a new one will, will be will be found. It's not be there. All right. Uh, I don't know, 14 correspondence and petition. That the correspondence package number I 23 May 09 be received as information and filed accordingly. Uh, any comments? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Couple, page 17, thinking of becoming a policeman in Ontario. The Ontario government is making it easier for police services across the province to recruit and train more police officers by removing tu tuition fees for the basic constable training program at the Ontario Police College and immediately expanding the number of recruits that can be trained each year. Page 27, do you have a criminal record? The Ontario government is investing 12 million to support nine innovative projects designed to help up to 2,000 people leaving the justice system or with prior criminal records find meaningful jobs with local businesses, helping them create connections and a sense of belonging within their community. Page 40, are you curious when you will be getting high-speed internet? The Ontario government is launching a new interactive map for users that can then search the map by address, community, or municipality, try to find project details, including information on construction status and internet service providers. Page 46, the Ontario government is updating the grade 10 career studies curriculum and is introducing mandatory resources for teachers and students on mental health literacy in grades seven and eight. These resources would support students as they achieve and prepare for the next steps of, in their future. Page 79, there are between 1,500 and 2,000 summer student positions at Ontario Parks across the province. Students can contact Ontario Parks at Ontario.ca with any questions. And that concludes the correspondence. Uh, I just want to note on page one, Ontario is launching a plan to boost math, writing, and reading skills. The government is proudly boasting that it's investing $180 million uh, towards classrooms, which invests $71 million towards a new math plan, and $109 million towards literacy. I would, as a professional educator, like to see the government continue its investment in supporting classrooms by supporting early childhood educators and educational assistants who help make math and literacy work. And I'm just going to stop there. <laughs> All right. Um, now that's uh, that's just for information. So we don't need to okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. We need we need know what we do. Okay. Yeah. So all in favor. <laughs> and now we have quite a few bylaws and then we can I'll just break through all of them. Uh, do we need to pour any of them out? That the following bylaws being or hereby enacted and passed. Bylaw number 7381-23, adopt the 2022 consolidated audited financial statements. Bylaw number 
7382-23, adopt the 2022 operating surplus funds allocation. Bylaw number 7383-23, adopt the 2023 tax rates. Bylaw number 7384-23, appoint Oliver Jacob as acting deputy clerk. Bylaw number 7385-23, award tender number PW 2023-07, which is the 2023 road rehabilitation projects. And bylaw number 7386-23, award tender PW 2023-08, the Daniel Eady Galvin Street intersection realignment and culvert replacement. There is one in there in the middle, something about Oliver Jacob. <laughs> uh, it's kind of slipped in there. I, I'm not too sure, but just wanted to say how pleased I am to, to see Oliver in this role as our deputy clerk. So, that I love it. and for the public, it's something that's got to be able to talk about the staff in the closed session. It's like, it's not just the hearing. Did you ever inspect the ground now? No, we did not. Councilor oh. Cooper. Let me know. And then all in favor. Hey, can you want some help? Any questions from the media? Oh, and we do have one closed session matter. The council meeting closed session to discuss one matter regarding a proposed or pending acquisition of land by the municipality or local board pursuant to section 239-2C of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended regarding a tax sale.